All right, so today we're going to begin a new study uh, through the book of Lamentations. Um, I've entitled this uh, study, Dark Clouds and Great Grace. And today I want to give you just a bit of an overview um, of this book. And uh, I think it's rather fitting, uh, for me at least, um, that we come off of the book of Ecclesiastes, which is kind of dark and depressing and bleak and dark tones. And then I just decide that, let me just continue on that train uh, and take us that way as we look through the book of, of Lamentations. But I don't just want to study this book and its five chapters, um, which we will do. Uh, but I also want to take some time in the first few weeks uh, to really help us understand and catch a grasp of what lamenting is, um, what lamenting gains for us, um, how it's actually quite healthy and helpful um, as we walk through this life and as we deal with the realities that stand um, before us. So I want to look at the purpose of the, the lament along with how appropriate it actually is. And so you may not have ever heard that before, um, but lamenting is an exercise, if you will. Uh, it's something that is very useful, and I'll give you a bit of that um, this morning as we look through this and walk through this overview. Now, uh, as we consider the lament, and we will dive deep into this book, uh, the lament and its purpose is not just that we would walk around uh, mopey and downcast, um, but that we would actually uh, instead appropriately respond to that which is in front of us. Because when we look at the context of lamentations, it's deeply rooted <clears throat> in the prophet Jeremiah's response to God's judgment on the people of Israel. Lamentations is an eyewitness account of sorts to the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. And so just imagine the prophet Jeremiah, who <clears throat> was given the name the weeping prophet. Um, and I wanted to study Jeremiah, but that's really long and that would take a long time. But maybe we'll get there. Maybe we'll do that next. We'll see. Um, but imagine Jeremiah looking at the destruction of <clears throat> Jerusalem of the walls and the towers and the homes and the palace, the remains of the temple that was burned to the ground. And he writes these loud cries from the painfully fresh reality in front of him. And he actually writes this before he was actually forced into Egypt in 583 B.C. Now, what makes this very interesting and what brings us very close to our reality is that Jeremiah, for over 40 years, actually prophesied of this coming judgment. He prophesied of that day, of that time, when the, the people of Israel would fall into Babylonian captivity. He was actually scorned by the people for preaching that message of the eventual judgment. And it's interesting to me that Jeremiah knew what was coming, and not just from his own prophecy, but if we even go, if we go back even further, go 800 years prior, we see seeds of Jerusalem's destruction through Moses. In Joshua 23, verse 15 through 16, it says, But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord has given to you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and if you go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly off the good land that has been given to you. This is 800 years prior to the 40 years of prophecy of this coming judgment. And so when that judgment comes through the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, Jeremiah still responded with great sorrow at the suffering of the obstinate people of Israel. Now, you would think if you had that much time, the warnings kept coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. You would think that he would be 
prepared for it. You would think he'd be prepared for the bitter suffering and the heartbreak and the devastation and the pain and the distress. Yet I was thinking about that and I thought about our lives and grief and pain and turmoil and suffering and hardship and difficulty when it actually becomes a reality. I don't think anyone can appropriately prepare. We've all had moments like this. Maybe we've had a loved one in hospice care and they live a certain amount of time and you watch them slowly deteriorate and you think you're mentally prepared for it. But when that moment comes, the reality is much different. You've had expectations of things. You've had experiences of things where you've prepared. You knew what the outcome was going to be. You, 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 you've thought of all the hypotheticals. Yet when that time comes, the reality is much different than what your imagination put forward. That's where Jeremiah is at. And to try to articulate the feeling uh, that comes from a place of incredible sorrow and tremendous anguish, it's nearly uh, an impossible undertaking. Think of this, uh, the book of Lamentations, as uh, a eulogy, if you will at a funeral. The person who's dead is Israel. The officiant is Jeremiah. And the words are there. And there's many, many words in the book of Lamentations. The words are there. But they always come up short. Uh, whenever I deliver a eulogy, I say the very same thing. I realize that in this moment, in this time of commitment before the Lord and before loved ones and family, that my words are going to come up very, very short because it is really difficult to do justice to the life of a person in 20 minutes, right? But this eulogy that Jeremiah delivers is attempting to put into words what it is that he's actually feeling and what the people of Israel are actually feeling. But even in all of these words, it's nearly impossible to capture grief in words. It's futile to try to measure despair. It's maddening to try to understand the, the landscape of misery. Uh, lamentations is the funeral of Israel. And Jeremiah is standing figuratively in front of the people and he's delivering this eulogy of their death. And he's not only lamenting the devastating destruction that lies before him, but he's mourning the destruction of his home in Israel. As we walk through this book, we're going to see language that is dismal, images that are bleak. And I understand that. His city's dead. His people are grieved. His home is lost. All he sees figuratively are dark clouds. And so laments are all that come from his speech, expressions of deep grief and deep sorrow, statements of confusion and complexity and obscurity. And, and Jeremiah offers words to a people aghast and awed, people who are grieved and lost and confused. And we sense in these wailings of Jeremiah a couple of things. We sense the bitterness of God's judgment. We talked about that yesterday as we studied Revelation. We also see the reality of sin and its consequence. We see the pain of pride. We see the trouble of tribulation. Because what we see is that the extreme calamity of Israel was actually brought about by their own extreme defiance. That what Moses had said was in front of them. It was now their reality. Their sin was the cause of this. Their rejection was the cause of this. And we see a people who by their own disobedience and evil, they caused the temple to fall. By their own transgression, they brought this grief. By their own uncleanliness, they caused all of this. 
And in all of the calamity that they saw, in all of the destruction that lay before them, Israel had to have wondered if God had rejected them. And so they do what I hope you and I come to learn more about as we study the book of Jeremiah. They lament, hoping and pleading and crying out in desperation to God. Especially when every turn that seems to be made and every step that is taken, the agony seems to get more profound. Where the pain gets sharper and sharper. These are frequent occurrences in our lives, aren't they? Moments to where we see what's in front of us, and whether it's a result of our own sin, whether it's the result of sin in general, whatever it might be, whatever calamity, whatever trouble you find before you, uh, crying out in our affliction is all we can really do. Lamenting is a gift. It's something that we should come to understand. And this book reveals to us that there is great value in reflecting on what is in front of us. And there's great value in lamenting the elements of that reality. And that as we consider the truth of what we see, that we don't just experience relief. That we feel better because we got it out of our system. You know, like, you just need a good cry. Anybody ever tell you that? You just need a good cry. It's not just that you get it out of your system. It's that you lament so that you can gain clarity and then appropriately respond. Lamenting is not just an exercise to make us feel better. It's not just an outlet to let us let off steam and complain. It's not just that we would bemoan what's in front of us and then stay there. True lament invites us to examine our own lives. It invites us to deepen our understanding of the sovereignty of God. It invites us to acknowledge our lack of trust. It invites us to see our transgressions rightly. And it invites us to to a place of honesty and exposure. Yet chiefly, it invites us to recall the trustworthiness and the faithfulness and the steadfast mercy of God. Lamentations actually teaches us about who God is, despite its deep anguish and despair. On one hand, Jeremiah shows the people that they suffered just punishment for their many sins. Yet, on the other hand, there's this stark contrast He shows them God's mercy in all of its vibrancy and beauty. And the book of Lamentation brings about a really important and defining contrast when it actually comes to the character of God as well. We see justice and mercy. We see wrath and grace. We see punishment and forgiveness we see judgment and God's kindness. We're all mature Christians in here. All of those realities are the character of God. And all need to be remembered when we recall who God is. Justice and mercy, wrath and grace, punishment and forgiveness, judgment and God's kindness. All of it is God's character And all of it needs to be remembered when we recall who God is. Now, I also want to bring attention as we wrap up. I I knew it would be relatively shorter today. I I want to bring attention to another striking truth that we see in this book. You may have picked up on this if you've read Lamentations before. Maybe you haven't. But Lamentations actually teaches us a profound truth that cannot be overlooked It's one that's actually doctrinally foundational to our faith. And it's essential to our understanding of salvation. And it's wrapped up in dark tones. It's wrapped up 
in hopelessness. It's wrapped up in bleakness. It's wrapped up in these individuals uh, being lost. It's, it's wrapped up in having to endure pain and suffering. It's, it's, it's wrapped up in all of this. And, and here's what it is. It's that God will restore to us as expected and as he pleases. Unless we've been utterly rejected by him. The doctrine of election is all over the book of Lamentations. God's choosing of us is seen so clearly in the experience of Jeremiah and the judgment of Israel. Because not only do we see judgment, but we also see the steadfast love and the mercy of God that despite the destruction and sorrow, there is a glimpse of hope and expressions of trust in God's faithfulness. And laced in these laments are affirmations of God's compassion and grace and mercy and the unchanging nature of God and his willingness to extend grace to those who are his. In John chapter 10, 27 through 30, we see this clearly. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Although nothing but desolation existed in the land. Although God's covenant to the people of Israel seemed to have come to an end. And although salvation seemed to be lost, hope still remained. In Lamentations chapter 3, in verse 22 through 24, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And may we not leave this place or leave any reading of any of God's word without bearing in mind and being reminded of the cross. That just like the people of Israel looking at desolation and, and, and pain and suffering and all that they'd ever known is gone and destroyed, and Jeremiah offers these laments to God as we think and consider the cross. May we be reminded that because of the complete work of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf and because of the sovereignty of God and his gift of salvation, it's not anything that we do. It is a gift from God and God alone. And although there may be nothing but desolation in the land Escape of our lives. Even though God may seem distant and off. Even though all may seem lost. We're reminded that hope still remains for those who are his. And that's ultimately what this book draws us to. It'll take us down some interesting paths and some incredible concepts to consider. But at the end of the day, may we consider the cross. May we consider the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. And may we consider the choosing that God has done of us. And may we rest in knowing that we are his despite whatever's before us. So, Father, as we leave this place today, may we be encouraged. May we be reminded that although what we are currently experiencing may be dark and bleak and frustratingly difficult, may we be reminded of the cross. We are sinful, broken people who, who lean on our own understanding far too often, who trust in ourselves way too much who lean into what we think will help and what we think will fix and what we think will, will make things right. 
We are prideful. We are troubled. And yet, we are confident that because of your grace and your mercy and because of the work that Christ has done on our behalf, that we may hear on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. So Lord, would you draw us closer to you? Would you draw us to a deeper dependency on you as well? We love you, Lord. And we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.